are beautiful. You are beautiful. But you're the best. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Come on. Firstly, I was not prepared for how harrowing this film is in places. So thank you for that. <laughs> Sobbing on my couch. Well, when you had to kill his sheep, was that the tricky bit? Yeah, but also the performances between Michael and Sam were just fantastic. What was it like getting them back together again after so long on screen? <laughs> I think in the end they had a really good time. But mm. Kind of the great thing for the film was they really are, couldn't be more different people if they tried. Mm -hmm. uh, so them sitting together in a green room waiting for me to get my shots set up between Sam's, because Sam kind of tweets and messages people all around the world kind of mm. constantly. And as you'd know from the whole COVID break, um, he's, a, he's a very funny man. Mm -hmm. um, but he loves, he loves his social media. And social media for Caton is about stopping people uh, fracking and mm. helping out people with various causes and things. So they both are in their own little world. They both have a huge amount of respect for one another. And I think, um, I think doing the film together kind of made them both appreciate the skills that the other have because they're... You know, you don't make movies and television for 50 years without getting really, really good at it. So mm -hmm. directing actors like them, and, and obviously I know Caton backwards, um, it's, it's an absolute joy to work with them on where the camera is and how, the, how to pitch their performance. It, you know, it's just fantastic. So they made your job easier for you then, not harder? Uh, that'd be the short version of the, <laughs> of, the, of the answer. It wouldn't be strictly true. Uh, I think at times Sam was slightly shocked that he had to work all day, every day on the movie. I think Sam hasn't actually played a lead role in a film for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think in his mind, uh, when you make a movie, you do a couple of days work on set and then you go for nice long lunches with famous people. And, and on this film, he had to really, really work hard and he, Boy, did he work hard. Not only is he in every, nearly every scene in the movie, but he also had the sheep to deal with and, and his patience and his preparation and his ability to do all that stuff was incredible. So obviously this film is based on an Icelandic story, but what is your Rams about at its core? Oh, look, at its core, it's, it's about what the original one was about as well because uh, Grimmel's... Uh, version called Hruta in Icelandic. Great pronunciation there. <laughs> uh, is based on the Icelandic uh, saga. Mm -hmm. and the, so the story of Cain and Abel, which is in the Bible, the story of two warring brothers who have diametrically opposed personalities is one of the oldest stories in the human mm -hmm. lexicon. So I, as far as I was concerned, I was remaking that story. And, and Grimoire had his version of it and I, I approached it that way so I, I'm I was a huge fan of the film and and it was on this on the festival circuit when Last Cab to Darwin was was on the festival circuit so I knew a lot about it but I also knew that the film version that I wanted to make I would like it to appeal to a broader audience than Hrutar could um, and al although um, Grimoire's film is beautiful it's also slow and dark and a lot of people would find it hard going. It rewards a festival audience and it rewards film people that love movies like me. It's too slow a film basically to find that broad audience. And I was really intrigued to know what it would be like if we, we let the audience see what happened to the community that these people lived in, not just to the brothers. So introducing the community, setting it in Australia and then dealing with the idea of men on the land, mm -hmm. um, which is in, in its own way a big issue in Australia. I, I just knew all those things would be interesting. Um, so we, we, we approached it from that point of view. We never approached it as a remake, um, but you know, most of the, so many great films in the history of filmmaking are reimaginings of stories that have been told three or four times already. Um, so I just looked at it for, from it being a tradition, you know, in filmmaking to tell a story again. 
in your own way. And it ended up being so relatable this year, didn't it? Between the bushfires and a pandemic, it's just there's so much symmetry in this story right now. So, someone I just spoke to said said that why don't I make a film about lotto numbers next? So <laughs> everyone can find out what they need. Um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> the idea, particularly, I mean, we knew bushfires are, are a big part of our lives, and they and every every summer, somewhere in mm. Australia, there's issues with bushfires, and the and the volunteer fire brigades that exist around the country are extraordinary they're uniquely australian and i made a tv show called fireflies many years ago that i was the lead in for the abc i've spent time with those so i knew that world and it was great doing that stuff but the pandemic thing that was really just incredible because the metaphor for us where sheep are us and what do you do when you've got a disease that's that infection mm. uh, and in the case of these guys they had to kill all of their sheep so that discussion about is that yeah. reasonable, is that fair, should we lock it down to this degree and should we and destroy mm. our industry, all those questions are being asked now by us, of our, particularly of our elderly, you know, and do we see them as sheep or do we see them as our, our grandparents <laughs> um, and everything in between. So, yeah, it, it really it couldn't be more timely. And how did you settle on the location? Was it Mount Barker in Western Australia? It was a beautiful location. The original idea was 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 the producers, um, Janelle and Aidan, saw rams, and you know when we're on the festival circuit, and mm. it was them who went. You know what? Imagine this in WA. That's a really it was a really clever thing to do because it never crossed my mind. They, their original idea was simply that what if they were bushfires? What if it wasn't snow, but it was heat? Which is what, mm. if you grow up in WA during summer, it's it's incredible. It, it's, a, it's a very visceral thing, just like the ice in Iceland is visceral. So they, they did all that. And then it was just like looking for the right town and, and Mount Barker ticked all the boxes. Um, it meant we could also use a few shots around Albany, which is incredibly beautiful. I grew up going down south on surfing trips. So I know that area really, really well. And mm. just for everybody, it was it was such a such a great experience. You know, I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. It must have been great being able to film in your home state then. Yeah. And and my, you know, my 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 family came over at various times and I was there for quite a long it, it was honestly it was it was it was really fantastic to shoot down there in WA shooting West Australian characters. A lot of people from, from Mount Barker in the movie. Mm. And no, it was just, it was a joy. I'll never forget it. I just want to touch on quickly the use of the word righto in the film. It uh, says so much in so many different ways. Was that, that was intentional, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, that was, um, that was Jules's way of conveying. Look, the thing we have in common with Icelandic people Mm. is that particularly Australian men is the ability to say a lot without saying much and <laughs> uh, Australian men are, particularly in the country are very taciturn just like um, Icelandic farmers are I think that was kind of our touchstone to what's really similar between these characters is that the big issue in you know we're, we're dealing with with depression in Australian men in the country and in farming communities is getting them to talk Mm. No, that's the hardest thing. And so we use the word, the term rhino as a way of kind of saying, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, we're okay. I know what's going on. And so it was originally for the character of Colin, it was his way of avoiding conversation. So people would say shit to him and he'd go, righto. Yeah, I and loved it. Out of it. But at the end, when he and uh, and his brother say right to one another at the end, it's a good thing. It means I understand you. I definitely loved it. And I've got to wrap it up now. Sorry, Jeremy. But just before I go, would you have a message for Australians out there who are maybe feeling a little bit hesitant to get back into the cinema still? Well, I would say uh, go into a cinema that you love, wear a mask uh, and enjoy, this, enjoy going to watch a movie and with other people around you that's that's the whole point of making movies is it's the opposite experience of sitting on your couch with your earphones on yeah. watching the entire season of Handmaid's Tale or whatever it is you're yeah. doing 
you go along, get some popcorn, have a glass of wine, go with your family and watch a movie together. It's, there's, it's, you can't beat it. That's what we love. Exactly right. Thank you so much for your time today, Jeremy. I have to wrap it up, but thank you so much for your generous answers. Cheers.